the Online Trading Academy. Uh, I've been an instructor with the Online Trading Academy for uh, quite a while. Um, I'm actually uh, somebody that uh, lives in Chicago, Illinois, and um, my story basically is that years and years ago, um, I met up with uh, our Director of Education at the Online Trading Academy, Sam Seiden, and I'm sure all of you uh, that are attending the webinar here heard of Sam and probably have seen some of his webinars. Um, okay, good. Yes, um, Sam Seiden is my um, uh, my personal mentor, all right? And as um, as a mentoring student, as somebody who's known Sam for years and years, um, I'm pretty much going to talk to you uh, about um, the same thing that Sam talked to me about years and years ago and why I'm starting off this webinar with the slide that you see right now is because um, this picture here that you see was what it took for me kind of to understand how much, uh, how markets worked. And um, uh, Sam explained to me that current price is trading just about where everybody thinks it's worth and based on all the news that comes out and all the information that comes out. Current price of most every asset is current price. Um, as you went down from current price, uh, you would come into the areas where uh, there were large orders to buy. And, of course, Sam actually handled these orders, these stacks of orders that you see here. Um, that's how he figured out uh, how markets work, and that's how he taught me how markets work. So this slide's pretty cool because it actually shows the stacks of orders that Sam used to have on his desk. And we're just looking at current price. It could be the current price of any asset. Obviously, the dollar versus the Japanese yen is what we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. Um, and ab above current price, Sam said he would have stacks in different prices at different amounts of sell orders. And these would be orders that were called in by large institutions um, before the market opened mostly. And... Um, Sam would call, uh, would take the orders as these people called in, and they'd usually place these orders well in advance of actually the markets moving. And what he would say is wherever he had the largest stack of buy orders on the left side of his desk was where true demand would be in a market, and wherever he had the largest stack of sell orders would be where true supply would be in this market. So I always want to start off this conversation that we're going to have with uh, what I was fortunate enough to learn from Sam Seiden and anybody that attends his webinars, you know, it's pretty much going to be um, the same message. It's not going to change very, very much at all. Um, and that is that uh, prices turn in areas where demand exceeds supply. And if you could look at what that picture looks like on a price chart, um, just this little chart right here. Um, this picture right here is uh, sideways trading before a sharp rally, and here we have some sideways trading before a sharp drop. And so what Sam said to me, and I'm sure you've heard him say over and over again, was the origin of this drop is where he would have leftover unfilled orders to sell. And at the origin of this rally, you would have leftover unfilled orders to buy. All right, so let's keep this in mind. Um, the demand where he had leftover unfilled orders to buy and the supply where he had unfilled orders to sell, well, that would force a market to go sideways like you see this market doing here. So this market's kind of trading in a sideways pattern. And so at this point, it looks like the market – at the very last candle on this chart, it looks like this market wants to go higher. It wants to begin to trend. And if it begins to trend higher, well, obviously, then we're going to have a situation where we have a uh, bullish type of market. So now let's keep that in mind, and let's take a look at this picture here. Let me bring something over here really, really quick. All right. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see now a little chart that I have 
marked on here that says cyclical trend. Okay, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, all right, good. So on this particular chart, you're going to notice where it says two words, support at the bottom here, support level, and it says resistance up here at the top, it's a resistance level. And once you see where it says resistance and support, um, I want you to substitute now. Uh, demand at the bottom of this little sideways channel and supply at the top of this little sideways channel. And <clears throat> if you do that, then you could see where when the market was going sideways between these two areas, um, there was no trend. And obviously the next trend for this particular asset would be if it broke out to the upside, it would begin to trend higher as it did here on the end of the chart. And if we go back up to the top of the chart area, once again, you're going to see an area that says trading range. You're going to see resistance level. You're going to see support level. And, of course, uh, we're going to substitute now instead of support and resistance, we're going to substitute demand and supply. And we're going to say, okay, when the market's trading sideways here, there is no trend. And then once the market breaks out of the uh, channel to the downside, we begin um, a bearish market phase or a bearish market cycle. All right. And I call this a cyclical trend, folks, because um, it, it has a cycle that's pretty much repeatable. It's repeatable in pretty much every asset that you could think about. Um, I want you to look at this picture really quick, and I want you to compare it to this picture right here. And obviously, this is an asset from 2009, Apple Computer, and it's a chart where Apple Computer was going sideways for a period of time between 2008 and 2009, and it broke out into a bullish market phase, and off it went. It began to trend higher, and it trended higher all through 2008, 2009, 2010, 11. All right, and of course, it didn't go straight up. Um, we we kind of went sideways and down a little bit during this uptrend. We had little periods where we went sideways and then up again, sideways and up again. All right. So um, we began what we call the bullish market trend for Apple Computer. And obviously, um, we'll go to the dollar versus the yen because we have a similar picture coming up here shortly. Uh, back in 2009, when the market trend began, um, I sort of explained to the students at Online Trading Academy, just like I'm explaining to you, that once this happens, um, we begin a new bullish market cycle. Okay? But let me go back here a little bit further, and let's explain uh, the psychology of everything that you see happening here. And the psychology of everything that you see happening here is probably important, too, because um, when the market was down near the lows back in 2008, um, and it could be any market. It doesn't have to be just a stock market. It could be any asset. Um, your emotions are pretty much uh, exactly where you see they are right here. Um, near the bottom of that bear market, we had a lot of people telling you that it was time to dump everything, and you might have been thinking about selling everything yourself, and some of you may have even sold everything yourself, got out of the market. So it was very, very difficult during that period of desperation and pessimism, um, very, very difficult to be even uh, remotely interested in buying anything because the market had fallen so hard and for some of us, it had fallen the second time in, in 10 years. So, you know, a lot of people were worried about getting burned. So even though Apple was near the lows of that chart, and even though the dollar yen that I'm going to show you here in a minute was near the lows of those charts and whatever, nobody really wants to buy when everything is down. And the hardest thing about what we do and what we teach at Online Trading Academy, the hardest thing is to get students to understand that um, this is a repeatable cycle that you're going to you're going to go through probably for the rest of your life, unless of course you get too big on the first time up, and then maybe you won't have but one time, you know, 
But when I look at this chart, I also look at where we currently are in the stock market and in many parts of the world, it's the same thing. We've had a nice big bullish phase. Uh, we were up 30% in our stock market last year, and um, there were a lot of people telling you this is going to go up forever. It's, uh, well, it's a great time to get in. Um, use this opportunity right now as a, as a buying opportunity. Uh, this is easy. Let's borrow money to buy more. Uh, these are the emotions you're going to have when the market is bullish. And uh, as a currency trader, as a stock trader, as any kind of a trader, uh, if you let the greed get to you when the market's going up and you really believe that, you know, markets are going to go up forever and they're just going to keep rising and rising, um, you're probably not going to last more than once, maybe twice if you're lucky. Um, and then, of course, if you're going to ride everything down and, and suffer that that pain of riding everything down because you believe in this stuff, right? Um, you may not last very long. So hopefully um, by listening to Sam talk about demand and supply levels when he comes on here and talks about how, how important that is and then putting that together with your emotions and with the market cycles of all the different assets, hopefully you'll, you'll be on the right side of a trend uh, if and when the market does change and turns, turns around. So let's look really quick. Um, one other little chart I want to show you guys right here. So this is a chart of the dollar versus the Japanese yen, and this goes way, way back into time. It goes all the way back to uh, the beginning of the um, – uh, really, the, the forex markets as we know right now it was the end of the the Bretton Woods era. It was the 1970s. It was the U.S. going off the gold standard. It was the beginning of the currencies uh, floating freely. And once those currencies began to fro uh, float freely, um, you could see that at one point in time um, – the dollar versus the Japanese yen was trading in the 350s. So that meant that for one of our U.S. dollars, you could get 350 of their Japanese yen. And what you're looking at this chart is something called a, a secular trend. And, you know, if you go from the 1970s to the year 2014 and you look at this monthly chart, you're going to have to agree that the trend on this chart is uh, very much down. So, the secular trend, the trends that last for long, long periods of time, and um, there's a definition here on Investopedia if you want to read about what a secular market is, what a secular market trend is. Um, you, you'd have to agree that the, the trend for the dollar versus the Japanese yen is down, all right? But during that secular trend, we've had several cyclical bull market rallies in this longer-term secular bear market, and I just drew some trend lines and took a picture of a chart, um, and this time I kind of highlighted the, uh, the rallies that we've had during this long-term uh, bear market where we've lost almost 74% of the value of the uh, U.S. dollar versus the yen, and um, we've had a 12% rally, 32% rally, 20% rally, 57% rally, and that's what we mean by a cyclical bull market rally in the longer term secular bear. And um, pointing this out because at the time I took that picture in May of 2012, uh, the U.S. dollar had not yet began a rally against the uh, Japanese yen. It was very much down and looked like it was going to head lower and even make new lows. But we were pretty close to the bottom at that point in time. So this is a picture of a chart of the U.S. dollar versus the Japanese yen. I'll bring it up here a little bit. And on this particular chart, um, we've marked off at the very bottom down here. Uh, I marked off a demand level between about 77.50 and about 75.95 uh, at the bottom of the chart, which was the origin of a rally from um, back in uh, 2012. And then I marked off a supply level, and that supply level was around 82 to about 84. And so what we had here was we had a, um, a 
a supply level and a demand level, which kind of held this currency pair sideways for a long period of time uh, during the year in 2012. And this great big vertical line that I put on the chart here happens to be uh, in May of 2012 when um, I started actually doing a blog for the Online Trading Academy. And I did this blog uh, in something called our Power Trading Nation. And I began covering the dollar versus the Japanese yen as one of the assets on the blog. And um, the reason I did that is because uh, at Online Trading Academy, we teach you demand, supply, and trends. We call that our Online Trading Academy core strategy. And, of course, we don't really try to predict which way a market is going to go because you can pretty much flip a coin anytime you want. Markets are random. They'll go up and down. Uh, from day to day. <clears throat> However, once this market breaks out of a sideways consolidation and begins to move in one direction, then that is what we call the bull market phase. And this is what happened on this particular chart until we reached uh, around 104 in the dollar versus the yen. We ran into some supply from the past. And then we've kind of pulled back to 95. So we've traded now for a while in a sideways range between about 104 and 95 um, as the market has been digesting this big move up that it had. So um, I'm going to click here on this link, which takes us to an area of our website on Online Trading Academy's website. Um, and this is something that we call the Power Trading Nation. It's where our students get together and the students that are trading multiple assets, they have a chance to interact with each other. And um, this is my profile page. And what I have here is uh, pretty much uh, an archive of every one of the blog posts that I've done since I started the, doing the blog, and it's been two years now, January of 2012. And if I go to the last page here, and we look at um, the first few posts that I made. Um, I actually started off this post with uh, a couple of little random posts at the beginning of uh, the blog because we weren't organized yet. And then I did a blog post where I said, corn is interesting on the weekly chart. It's very difficult to see, but it was actually a wheat chart. Um, corn was interesting also, but wheat was actually beginning the bottoming phase um, and the wheat market actually bottomed in January of 2012, and I was pointing out to the uh, to the students that were reading the blog back then that now it was going to trade sideways between a demand level and a supply level in the weekly chart. And, of course, the next trend move for wheat would be whichever one of these levels got broken through. That would be if we continued lower or if we started a cyclical bull market rally in a bear market in wheat. All right, and as you can see, the following week, the wheat actually had a nice rally out of the demand level, and it began to move a little higher. And um, the funny thing about that is uh, it's one of the only assets, I think, that I have on the blog here that uh, it actually completed that whole bull market cycle phase. So this is the completed picture of that pullback in January of 2012 right here. And this area right here was where that pullback was in January of 2012. And then we broke out of that sideways consolidation and we began a bull market phase that rallied 52% uh, in, in uh, July of 2012. So from here to here, we had a 52% bull market rally. Um, we ran into some supply levels around 924 to 998 a bushel, and then we began a big, long, sideways uh, stage three distribution phase where we went sideways, actually with lower highs, so it was actually looking bearish at the time. And then it started a bear market phase, which lasted through uh, December of 2012 into April of 2013, where we once again went sideways again. And, of course, we went sideways in that channel, folks, until about uh, the end of June of last year, and then we broke out into a new bear market low. And so the wheat market has actually 
gone on to extend this picture, and um, it's actually gone quite a bit lower. So um, I, I always point this out to the students. Uh, I only have one asset on the blog of the seven assets that I follow that's actually completed an entire uh, bull market, bear market, and uh, two sideways patterns, accumulation markup, distribution markdown. Um, so, again, the whole reason for the sideways trading was a supply level and a demand level. Once we took out the supply level, we trended higher. And we trended higher due to a drought here in the U.S. Um, we cut through a lot of supply levels until we reached these higher prices at around $10 a bushel. And then we began the bear market phase. And we stayed in that bear market phase until we once again came back down to the origin of the um, the bull market phase. All right, so that's another asset that I cover on the blog, and that's pretty much where we ended up there. Uh, so this is the Power Trading Nation, and this is the area where the students would go to to read my blog. And we have uh, my blog, which I do every week, uh, the Weekly Market Cycle Review. This is the most recent one that I did. And um, on this one here, I cover the um, U.S. large cap stocks. I cover the Indian Nifty 50. I cover the bond market, the U.S. 20-year bond market. Here's our wheat market, which, again, has been making new bear market lows. It actually broke out and tested 550, where it's bouncing a little bit right now. Um, I do Apple Computer for the students that are following Apple Computer. And here's the dollar versus the Japanese yen. So this is the most recent chart of the dollar versus the Japanese yen, which – has been trading now um, in a range. It broke out of the top of the range a little bit. It made new highs at the beginning of this year. Um, and now, of course, it's it's pulling back due to all the turmoil that we have here in the, in the world. Um, it's finding some buyers at around the 101.68 level of demand here, and it's been bouncing off this demand level uh, for the last three or four days, kind of going sideways. I do this blog every Wednesday, folks. Um, I do it once a week on Wednesday. And um, the nice thing about it, though, is the students have a chance that our members of Online Trading Academy's uh, Power Trading Nation, they have a chance to follow um, all seven assets. I actually also do the Russell 2000 small cap stocks uh, for um, the students. So I do, I've done these seven assets now back since January of 2012. So what we're going to do um, during this session and possibly one more session is um, we're going to actually go through the step-by-step -step, uh, sideways trading of the dollar versus the yen going back to um, May of last year. And we'll go all the way to where we are at the present. And so Luca asks, is this forum only for Online Trading Academy students? Yes, Luca, this is one of the areas on the Online Trading Academy website where you have to be a member of the Online Trading Academy uh, student body to have access. It's our student lobby for students that are members of the Online Trading Academy uh, uh, student body. So it's not open to the public. Uh, of course, we have the lessons from the pros area, which is open to the public. And Sam Seiden comes on here and does webinars for you guys all the time. Uh, as far as demand and supply. And Sam Seiden is a short-term trader, so um, I know he's aware of all these trends and he kind of pays, uh, pays attention to the, uh, to the trends. Um, but it's not really the focus of what Sam Seiden trades on because he's a, more of a short-term trader. So um, he knows the stock market's high in the U.S., and He's still looking for shorting opportunities because of where we are on what we call the supply demand curve, right? So um, a couple other questions. Why did I pick the dollar versus the yen in the Forex? Well, actually, that's a question that was probably be answered by my uh, first post that I did uh, really quick here. 
I believed uh, back in um, 2012, April, that uh, the dollar versus the yen or, or any pair versus the yen actually was going to uh, probably begin to trend because um, it just seemed logical that uh, um, the Japanese yen's currency was very, very strong and Japan was probably not going to try to let that stay that way for very long. Of course, the best way to dilute the value of your currency is to do what they did. And they just began flooding the world with Japanese yen again, as they had done in 2003 to 2007. Um, we're doing something here called quantitative easing, and they're doing quantitative easing about five times the rate of what we're doing it at. So, um, so yeah, um, I, I just had a feeling that the, uh, the the yen would trend against most currency pairs, and I stuck with the U.S. dollar because I live in the U.S. dollar. I live in the U.S., so the dollar is my currency. Um, but on April 16th last year, or, or actually two years ago, um, I started a blog years ago, and I used to publish my trading ideas and my charts on my blog on a daily basis, and this was when they were just brand new. And, of course, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, the blog I did was just a couple of little posts on a website, uh, mostly in the S&P 500, actually. And so now I said to the students when I did this post, I said I would begin doing this blog as a trading journal. and. I would begin to share my thought processes based on my style of trading the way that I had done it before because, uh, bottom line, it's a great way for you to record what you're thinking, what you're doing, and it's a great way for you to have something you can look back at and you can monitor your results. And um, so I started the blog for the Online Trading Academy students in an area where they could interact with each other. And my style of trading is swing and position. It's based on demand, supply, and trends, which is our core strategy. And my definition of the four-stage market cycle is uh, the sideways accumulation phase. And I believe institutions like to buy low and sell high. So whenever they get a chance to buy something low, they accumulate large positions. And then begins the uptrending or markup phase. And these words, by the way, accumulation, markup, distribution, markdown, they come from um, the 1900s, uh, 1930s. These are not things that I've made up. Uh, uh, none of what you're seeing here did I make up. It's just my my way of looking at the markets. Um, I believe that um, Charles Dow was the first person to talk about this uh, sideways accumulation, markup phase, distribution, markdown followed up by a gentleman named Richard Walker Shawbacker, R.W. Shawbacker, in the 1930s. He kind of elaborated on it in a couple of books that he wrote in the 1930s. Um, but, you know, he said, as did Dow, that we had a repeatable market cycle where we went sideways when people were uncertain, and we went up when people were greedy, and we went down when people were um, uh, fearful. So as a swing and a position trader, the one thing I will tell you is I use this information on a weekly chart, and I got this weekly chart, and I got this 30-week moving average that I use to define the trend from one other gentleman who uh, talked about this market cycle in a book called Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets in the 1980s named Stan Weinstein. Uh, the book is still available on Amazon for very little money if you want to read it or if you can get it out of the library. It's a good book on the market cycle, but there's plenty of articles on market cycles. And I think there's other um, there's other people that come on here and talk about market cycles too besides me, so there's, there's a lot of information out there if you want to look around for it. Um, so my first entry was the dollar versus the Japanese yen, and I wrote an article for Traders Magazine back in 2012 that said um, I was making a case for the possibility that currency traders should want to think about shorting yen instead of the dollar as a funding currency in their carry trades going forward. And um, this was the picture. This was the first chart from that picture from when I did my first blog post. And 
I had my supply zones overhead that I thought was going to hold us sideways for a while, and I had my one demand zone down here near 78, which I believe would probably be um, the bottom of the uh, market if we had some kind of a pullback. So this is a this is the actual link to that blog post that I made on April 16th uh, before I actually began the um, the blog. So that's the chart right there. And I would write every week, like you see here, um, I would write little posts, and I include little charts on those posts. And so this is a little chart from the week of uh, 5-1 of, 12, uh, of 2012. And at that point in time, we were falling away from the supply levels up here, and we were working our way back down towards the demand levels. And on the following week, um, we actually formed another little tiny base or, or of supply, which is kind of like what usually happens when a market begins to move lower. It will base and drop, and uh, those become pockets of supply. So on the week of 5-8, which is the following week, uh, we sort of dropped a little bit lower, and we were looking once again to uh, – retest this demand level at some point in time. And I, mo I put a little post in the blog that a momentum trader obviously likes to sell things that are falling in price and they like to buy things that are rising in price. Um, so if you wanted to go short uh, below 79.85 or so, then um, as a momentum trader, you could possibly take a little tr short trade down to that demand level below. It's not the way I trade, obviously. I'm, I'm hoping to stay short from the supply level at the top of the channel till we get down to the bottom of the channel. And if that's the case, if you're trading that trend where you're short already, then, you know, you wouldn't be looking to enter at these lower prices when you could have had a chance to sell at a higher price. So we went sideways for a little bit. And I got to tell you, um, a lot of this first part of this presentation each week, now we're in the week of the 22nd, um, uh, we kind of went sideways for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, right? And um, that happens. And then we broke the support, and we began to move down lower once again um, to the demand level that you see below. And as we got down to the demand level, we popped a little bit higher, and I, I don't think we quite hit the demand level the first time down. Now we're in the week of uh, June 10th. I think we hit a little bit of demand on a daily chart. So I kind of took a few pictures from other charts, and we started to trend higher once again. Now we're heading back up towards the top of the range. So on June 27th of 2012, we actually created a new little demand zone above the lower zone. So obviously the market is a bit on the uncertain side as to the next trend direction for this currency. So it's just chopping up and down inside of a channel. And as soon as we got back to that inner supply level, that nearby supply level at about 80, we started to fall from the level again. And, of course, if you're currency traders, um, you're probably at that point looking for something that's trending a little bit more. Um, you're probably more interested in looking for a currency that's going to give you some room to move. Um, 77.60 to 80.77 is uh, not that bad. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of a decent size range, depending on where you put your stops. But it's not the most exciting currency in the world. And, of course, um, um, these things are um, – these things are going to do this from time to time. They're going to go sideways. So I'm trying to keep up on the chat here. I have something from Boyke. Ask OTA to let me write an article once a month on lessons, uh, lessons from the pros. Well, Boyke, uh, here's here's some bad news about that. Um, uh, when I was doing lessons from the pros, and if you were to go to the OTA website back in 2009, um, I did a little bit of the lessons from the pros in 2009, and I, I quickly ran out of things to write about. So I 
I asked them if they could get somebody to do those lessons from the pros that were better typers than I was and that uh, were better, um, you know, more more interested in uh, uh, in doing the newsletter. So I kind of bowed out of that, and I went with this blog instead. And you know, the nice thing about it is, is every week I have something to write about. And um, I have the same seven assets that I cover every week. I don't have to look for new assets, and I don't have to look for new topics to write about. And you know, I appreciate the, the, the different articles that are written by the instructors that do it. I I commend them for doing it because honestly, um, I'm not going to write about uh, Ichimoku clouds when I don't trade with Ichimoku clouds, and I'm not going to write about. Fibonacci because I don't use Fibonacci and I'm not going to write about um, you know much else but what I do trade with and that's demand and supply and you already get articles from Sam every week on that so um, anyway um, so here we are moving sideways now it's the end of June of 2012 and um, now look at how narrow these ranges got these na- the ranges are getting narrower and narrower as we moved into July of 2012, and obviously that's a time of the year where most of your currency traders are on vacation, um, basically from May until about the, the October is a, a big vacation time. So this currency really wasn't doing a thing. It was stuck in those ranges between 79 and 80, so uh, stuck inside of a 100 pip range, and it's the size of the candles getting smaller and smaller every day and finally we actually broke through a uh, demand level and we started to move lower again to retest uh, a demand level down at about 78 now this is about the middle of July of 2012 and occasionally I use different platforms and you know I use mostly trade station charts these are MetaTrader charts um, so now we're trending pretty good, and we come down into this lower demand level. So we've had a few weeks of moving lower, and we're in this demand level. And at that point, um, it's getting to the point where you could take an entry. Uh, this is one of the entries we teach our students where if you're inside the proximal and uh, distal lines of a demand zone or a supply zone, we can enter while we're in the zone with less risk. So that was a suggestion for anybody that was interested that was reading the blog. And then, once again, it's the end of July. It's the beginning of August. And as you can see, um, there's not a lot of movement. We're sort of going sideways in this demand zone for weeks. Not a lot of movement out of the zone. And then all of a sudden, we had a little bounce out of the zone. And pretty quickly, we had a nice rally by the middle of August of 2012, right? And um, we start to move higher, and we came right up to the supply zone at about 79.40, and uh, we started to go sideways up at the supply zone because that's the first area where the institutions had some sell orders. And so Luca is asking a question here about is there any way to know if there's going to be a way to tell if we have uh, distribution or, or accumulation going on. You know, I could only say from my experience that whenever there is accumulation, um, when you're trading sideways, I've noticed that you have higher lows on your candles. You'll have more or less uh, flat highs. You'll have higher lows. And when you have higher lows, it's a sign of institutions having to pay higher prices to accumulate the asset. Um, At first, on this particular chart, it looked as though they had a chance to buy all they wanted right here at about uh, 77.89. And then we kind of bounced a little bit higher, and they would have to pay uh, 78, 78 half. They'd have to pay higher prices. And you could almost draw a vertical trend line if you want. So if there is going to be a sign of accumulation, that's one thing that you might look for. And if you're somebody that uses indicators, um, I think there's some indicators that show accumulation and distribution. But 
nothing I use, really. I'm in the demand zone, so if I'm in the zone and I have to stop below the zone, then I have to find my risk, and that's about all I can do at that point. If I get stopped out, I get stopped out. Um, but we had a nice rally, and, of course, right into the supply level and right back down to this little demand level again, and we start to bounce out of the level again. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there was news. I, I don't remember what the news was in August of 2012. I'm sure there was good news that kind of drove the dollar up, and I'm sure there was some more bad news that drove it back down. Um, but it never fails to go right to the area where the institutions have those buy orders and sell orders and sort of bounces in the opposite direction again. And so from here, I think what ended up happening was we um, – oops – Kind of went a little too quick. I lost my mouse. There we go. We went through the level after a few bounces. And once we went through the level, we started to go lower again to retest those lower demand levels. And that happens a lot of times, too. So when you go sideways like that and you're sitting on an old demand level, eventually, if you use up the demand, you'll go lower. And, of course, if you use up the supply, you'll go higher. Um, and the question I have here, again, do I use volume? <clears throat> well, I have a volume indicator on the chart, as you can see, um, with an average true range indicator on there, too. But there's no volume bars because in TradeStation, we don't keep track of the volume. So um, there's really no way to keep track of the volume in spot 4X except maybe uh, except for maybe um, uh, platform-specific volume. So maybe volume can tell us something about accumulation and distribution. Oh, if you think about it logically, um, if somebody wants to buy something low, then what they'll probably do is they'll buy, and once they buy, it price starts to bounce higher. Um, they'll quit buying. And if they quit buying and there's nobody else buying, then, of course, prices will drift lower. And so if somebody's working in order for an institution down here and they're trying to get them the best prices possible, then for the most part what they'll do is they'll they'll buy a little bit until price drifts higher. And um, if they quit buying, then price will drift lower. So volume can really uh, volume can really get people to react. If all of a sudden they see volume coming in and a big volume bar, it can get you excited and get you to press the buy buttons or the sell buttons. So um, not somebody that's going to tell you that I use volume for anything other than um, for the students that it, like to look at it on the bottom of my chart. And this market doesn't have any volume at all. All right. So once again, um, now I have to expand my chart a little bit. And I have to go back and I have to look for a demand level from the previous year, um, earlier in the year. I have two daily demand levels. I had the one from uh, around February of that year, and we came all the way into that level, and we began to push higher, and right below that was the last demand level before we made new lows. So you can see the first time in June we tested the level, we had a pretty strong bounce out of the zone, and then when we came back and we tested the level once again, now we're in September, we pushed almost all the way through the level, and we bounced out of the level once again. Um, question is, what is distal? Um, well, there's two words that we use in our, our our lessons that we teach people. We have what we call the proximal line of a demand zone, which is the front line of a demand zone. We have the distal line of a demand zone, which is the back line. The proximal line of a supply zone is the front line, and the distal line is the back line. The word proximal means closer to, and distal means farther from. So um, we have a proximal demand level, which is the first demand level here between 77.60 and 77 even. And then we have a distal level below that between 76.60 and 76 even. So uh, the level that we were bouncing off of at the time was um, this proximal level at about 77.60. And here we are in September now of 2012. And we're beginning to move a little bit higher out of that demand zone. And we're also beginning to come up to the end of the um, the end of the session. Um, so I'll tell you what, um, if you guys have any questions, 
I mean, we came back down and retested that demand level again about a, just about a week later, so that rally didn't last very long. And we came back down and tested that level and started to bounce out of that level. And that's where I, begin, I believe that the beginning of the, uh, the move that we've had to the all-time highs actually began. So this is actually the beginning of that move. And um, I think that's where we're going to uh, we're, we're gonna leave it right now. Uh, we haven't started trending yet, the dollar versus the yen. But we have started to, to bounce off of demand levels and started to take out supply levels as we began October of 2012. And higher lows indicate institutions buying on weakness, which is one of those signs of accumulation. So as you could see, the market started to trend higher. It was getting ready to come up to the supply level at about 79.29. And um, – uh, that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it at October 17th of 2012 for this first webinar. We're going to do another one next month if you want to check the schedule, and it's going to be uh, part two of this webinar. Uh, I'm going to take you again from um, 2012 all the way to where we are in 2014. Um, and by doing this, um, showing you guys how what I see and what I was taught about how markets work, it's just price moving from level to level. And um, if you take out the supply level, you begin to trend higher. So um, I do it for our students. I hope it helps you too. Uh, I apologize for this little scratchy throat. I was, I was away and picked up a pretty nice cold. So we will do part two and maybe part three if it takes part three. Um, and I believe it's on the schedule already for some time in February. So thank you all for attending. Um, enjoy your rest of your day and uh, enjoy your trading. I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye.